Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Jolie. Hi there. How are you today? Just fine. Actually, it's a beautiful day here in Indiana where I am, so hopefully it's equally beautiful where you are. It is. I'm out here in Chicago, um, okay. also in the Midwest, and it is a gorgeous day out here. I'm so excited to talk with you today about your book. Um, can you tell me a little bit about it? Well, it is, I could actually show you the cover here, Forgiveness, the story of Eva Kaur, the a survivor of the Auschwitz twin experiments. And it's a, it begins a, with a childhood in a small Romanian village and goes through uh, Eva Kors and her sister's experience in Auschwitz-Birkenau primarily. And then um, it arcs into how she found her own personal salvation mm -hmm. after the trauma. I mean, the incredible trauma of this experience. So yeah. it's, a, it's a survivor tale. And it, it really is. I know I just said this to you, but um, so that way the audience can hear it too. It really is such an incredible book and it's an incredible story. Um, when I was hearing, I, I don't want to give anything away for people listening to it, but when I was hearing, um, like reading, especially like that ending, when you were talking about like how, what the forgiveness part of the book is, um, I was like, blown away um because it forgiving all of those people and all of these horrors that happened to her um really so inspiring and so brave well and it's um the thing about eva and her reaching this as um well and she would take she founded the candles holocaust museum in Terre Haute, indiana mm -hmm. which is a wonderful wonderful uh museum and she would she took trips, uh, groups of oh well students, adults, whoever wanted to go and um, to Poland, and would walk her um, pilgrims. I always like to think of them um, through this experience, as well as some really. Um, great Polish guides and museum staff members. So you got a real sense of what this place was that she went to. But, but after um, the first day that we had been in Auschwitz, because I went on, I've gone on two trips now. Mm -hmm. um, and the um, first trip, uh, we went through, we, we saw there's an excellent documentary made by a um, documentary filmmaker, Ted Green. And we had watched that with Eva. She answered questions. And then we had a further talk amongst the pilgrims. And I was just, I thought, given her experience, how could one ever get to forgiveness? And um, Leah Simpson, who was uh, leading the group from the Candles Museum, she said, well, it took her 50 years to get there. So it's not an easy thing. Um, it's not just, well, gee, I, I believe I'll forgive everybody who's done these terrible things to me. In fact, she, um, well, and um, it's no secret that on that trip, she actually died in Poland. But uh, several evenings after, in fact, our last evening in Krakow, Pola, that one of her, a, a man who had become a very, very good friend of hers and was, was coming from Germany to Poland to meet her was the grandson of one of Joseph Mengele, the, Dr. Joseph Mengele, that they called the angel of death, he was, uh, his grandfather was his chief medical assistant involved in this. And so um, when he met Eva, Eva talked about her forgiveness, but she looked at, at this gentleman and asked him, well, have you forgiven your grandfather? Mm -hmm. And he said at that point, 
he couldn't respond um, because his grandfather was one of the perpetrators. Yeah. And that relationship. So there, there are, we each have different ways to get there and different reasons to get there. And she yeah. was a great kind of apostle of, of um, just doing it if you can. That was that was definitely something that I really loved in the book, like what you were just saying that like just um, doing it if you can. Um, and because throughout it, especially like when you're talking about like how she came towards her journey of forgiveness, how she realized like not everyone can at every time in your life mm-hmm. and not everyone has to. But it's something that can really like help you internally. Um, that was something very powerful to read. Well, and it's, I think it really relates very much to um, when South Africa, after the fall of apartheid, um, with Desmond Tutu, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is a, another heroic figure, um, he thought, you know, there is, one might be justified and certainly is justified in the, the anger that would lead to revenge of yeah, all the, the black people of South Africa who had been so marginalized, so mistreated, just on and on and on. But, and he thought the only way that we could, survive, that South Africa could survive as a country was to, we have to reach a point of forgiveness or there will be a bloodbath. Mm-hmm. And so he was very instrumental with um, um, Nelson Mandela of setting up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which we will look at what people have done. We will openly, honestly, directly look at it, and we won't forget. But the only way we can reconcile, and there, w- there would be you know, punishments, there would be imprisonments, there would be all of that, but we have to look at the truth and then reconcile as peoples. Or it's an endless cycle. Yeah, definitely. And in this book, um, and like hearing the way that Eva would talk about forgiveness, it was very refreshing um, too, because I feel like a lot of the times that I've seen people talk about forgiveness, it can be a very toxic approach being like, you have to forgive someone immediately. And if you do not, you will never forgive them. And like, makes it so blown up like that. And that can cause so much stress around it. And mm-hmm. I, this was, it was, um, really impactful to read a case where someone went through these things and went, and it forgave as like almost like an act of rebellion against it. Yeah, it was. And actually, it's it's really fascinating that through the years that when she started to speak and be open about her experience and was able to to not only articulate it, but to come to some sort of peace, which is through the forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, she was visited at the museum by many people who had suffered um, all kinds of terrible uh, tragedies in their life, uh, rape victims, victims of the Rwandan genocide, just uh, that people found this, her idea of forgiveness, of laying down this burden, and in her case, in, was not just the pain, but the anger that the pain brought, mm-hmm. that she was able to go forward in her life. And many people have, from all kinds of different situations, have found that incredibly inspiring and instructive. Yeah, definitely. Um, Kind of switching up what we're talking about, can you tell me how this story kind of came to you um, and why you decided to write about her? Well, it's um, Eva was very well known through the Candles Museum and all her um, speaking. And I would urge people, if you want to find out about Eva, if you want to see her, um, then all you have to do is is put her name in a search engine and you will find all kinds of um, 
interviews and things with her. But so when she founded the Candles Museum, which is a great little facility, and I would urge anybody who's around the Terre Haute area, and Chicago isn't that far, yeah. to, to go in. Um, and you can actually interact with Eva. The, there is a hologram that the Shoah Foundation, uh, the Steven Spielberg Shoah Foundation, has of Eva in the museum. And she engages in this very interesting way, uh, even after her leaving this planet, uh, with anybody who has questions. But um, so she was well known. My wife um, is a, was for years an art teacher, and she had the Lilly uh, organization had art uh, renewal grants, and, or well, they were teacher renewal grants, so teachers could ask for all kinds. They would submit all kinds of different things, and and my wife had received several of those each summer. For several days, they meet on the campus of ISU, Indiana State University, and um, which is in Terre Haute. And then um, my wife is now one of the instructors there um, for that week. And she had been, you know, the Candles Museum has been there. And she was always busy and hadn't gone. But some other teachers said, look, you have to come. You've got to come this time. So she went. That was in July. She heard Eva speak and she called me immediately and said, Joe, you know, we have to go together and hear her. Mm -hmm. um, because I knew about her, but I'd never met her in person, never actually heard her speak. So it was um, November before we were able to finally do that. But in the meanwhile, I'd gone to... Um, we had both gone to Pittsburgh and I had friends, uh, dear friends there. And my friend Mark, who is uh, involved in uh, comic books as literature and, and things. And he introduced me to some people who were doing a selection of comic books about Holocaust tales of the heroes of the Holocaust. I've got a copy here. Chutzpah. Oh. And, and so that immediately made me think, wow, that Eva's story was one that you can't do in eight pages or 12 pages or even 28 pages. It, the whole arc of her story needed to be told. So I started thinking about a graphic novel, a graphic novel biography based on her life. And so it was only in November when we finally got there, Eva was just incredible. She was, uh, in the next month or two, she was going to undergo heart surgery, but she spoke for two hours on a Saturday, a very, on a Saturday afternoon. And um, besides for her pushing her walker ahead of her, which was kind of, I was, thought when you would see Eva with her walker, it was like she was coming in on her, you know, gallant steed. And she sat there on a very um, a low stage and engaged with the audience in a way that was absolutely incredible. And so, but I had put together before we went a sample of my work and Eva, of course, was very busy. She would, she talked, she met everybody. So I presented this germ of an idea to uh, Leah Simpson, who uh, is still involved with the museum, but was the interim director, and said, you know, I've got this idea about doing this graphic biography. And uh, if you, if it would be okay if you would present this to Eva, so she did. We got went back and forth, and um, I wanted to get not that it would be authorized by the museum or Eva, but I wanted to get the approval that it would be acceptable for me to do this. Mm -hmm. And the funniest thing of all was that um, talking to Leah, she said, "Well, 
Eva doesn't quite understand the idea of a graphic novel and the idea of being in a comic book. And was I going to make her a superhero? (laughs) And I said, well, no, there will be no spandex involved in this. (laughs) So (laughs) anyway, so and then I presented um, the the, um, artist renewal grants through the Indiana Arts Commission, got a grant and went on that fateful trip to um, Poland. And which I must say, I would have missed had I thought, because I thought, well, I want to do more research and get to know the story better before I go. So maybe I will put in a grant for next year. And my wife, Beth, said, Joe, if you're going to do this, do it now. And I'm not saying she's a prophet, but... You know, she was spot on. Things happen for a reason, you know, like that. It's that's so um, crazy to hear that, like, it was that trip too that you were like, oh, maybe I won't go on this one. And then yeah. it all lined up. Um, that that really is a fascinating story about how this all um, came to fruition. Um, how did you know that you wanted it to be a graphic novel specifically when you knew you wanted to write a biography? Well, I draw pictures and I love to put those pictures together as a story. <laughs> so for years, um, actually, it'll be um, in 22, I will have been doing editorial cartoons for first uh, the Bloomington Voice, which was a small alternative paper for about 10 years. And then the Bloomington Herald Times for the last 20 years or 19 now, almost 20. And so that's, uh, but that you have to tell a story in one panel. Mm -hmm. But I have always loved illustrated books. I, and so I've done a lot of illustrations for the uh, For Beginner series, and I've written a a couple of books with them. And actually, um, I've done several comic books I did years ago. I was commissioned to do a version of illustrated version of Treasure Island. And oh. so I have, I've been involved in the form really since I was about six or seven years old. Mm-hmm. That is, that's so cool. I feel you on the um, loving, always loving graphic novels too. I definitely um, understand that because it's, it's such an interesting medium and it can be so expressive. Um, it is. For sure. And, and one can do so much in um, a graphic novel that you can't actually do just with words. And yeah. um, there, and I'm glad, I'm so glad that it isn't just seen as a kid's medium anymore. Definitely. That, oh, this is, this is just spandex and capes. Uh, one can tell incredibly uh, important and serious stories in this medium and and I always think it is it's really our oldest literary medium um oh, yeah. look at the cave walls that our distant ancestors painted on telling the story of a hunt or making fire or then um the Sistine Chapel that is it is a graphic novel that you engage with by getting a sore neck <laughs> if you see it in person. So it's it's a great way to approach it. And, and the, um, it's a universal kind of expression that it's important. I find it, you, one can do graphic novels without using any words whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and of course, it depends on the story. This is a story that that was very necessary to have uh, written language. But it's um, I, I really think and am so glad that it now is becoming as important as it is. I mean, it's amazing that the number of movies that get made these days from graphic novels, that's their primary source. Oh, and yeah superheroes or zombies but really serious expressions well now even to a trend that i've been noticing with um tv shows 
is that pe- these studios like Netflix, I've noticed done, has done this a lot. They take um, graphic novels and they turn them into shows and it's not oh, always Marvel or DC. Yeah. Like it's not, they're not only doing that because those are also very important, I would argue. And, yeah. but um, they, but it really shows the wide range that this um, medium can go into. Well, and I think it's very much a movie that you can hold in your hands. It's yeah. physically there. You And you can slow it down. You can stop it and rest for a while. You can re-engage with it. And um, so that's why, um, well, in my case, I didn't want every panel to be the same size. Mm-hmm. And that you can expand if you, if you, this is something that is very important that you want people to take in the whole thing, or is it transitional? Or um, in the sequence with the train, I wanted it to to slowly build as this this horrible train journey that still has a measure of hope mm-hmm. involved with it um, until it gets to that point where they they hear German spoken and the doors being opened. And that, that's something that you can do more gracefully, I think. And I, this is not, um, I think there are certain things that one can do with pictures in that way that have an, an emotional immediacy that sometimes words uh, aren't quite as immediate. Yeah. Definitely. Um, And I know that a lot of um, book podcasts don't always have graphic novels talked about and stuff like that. But that is always from the very beginning. I actually believe the first author I ever had on here, Elliot Serrano. Yeah, he was the first one. And he was um, a graphic novel author. because It's such an important aspect of the literary world. Um, And you can do so much with it. Yeah, and and it's exciting that um, more and more publishers and and uh, different um, and bookstores. I mean, it was uh, interesting to go into Europe twenty years ago mm-hmm. and see, you know, bookstores with an entire shelf, you know, a wall of graphic novels because it was considered with a with a an importance that it hadn't yet reached in the United States, but these days. Uh, go into a, a good bookstore and see if you can't find a shelf of of graphic novels. Oh my gosh! Yeah, or like the library. Like the other day, yeah. um, I was picking up a hold. I was like, "Oh, I'll also pick up a graphic novel." And I was like, "All right, which floor do I want to go on?" Because every floor has a graphic novel section. Like, mm-hmm. um, it's become something so important. I'm so glad that it's getting this recognition. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great way to to tell history too, which is why those, that opening chapter, I wanted to, to talk about how, well, it's called how they got there. I mean, it's just to explain what happened between World War I and when the uh, Moses family, the Eva's family mm-hmm. was taken to Auschwitz um, because it, it's, History often gets taught in this bite and that bite. And of course, this is not extensive and it's not difficult and it's and there's only so much one can do. But it's important to know what happened and how it happened. Um, We can hear the name of Anne Frank and we know in one sense Anne Frank's story, her immediate story. But we don't know. Well, how did this all occur? And uh, it's, um, I think it's a history, which is a, has always been important to me. Oh yeah, of um, course. Is, it, uh, is not taught as much as it should be because I, I do think it's how we got here. And um, if we wanna know where we might go and where we want to avoid going, you got to learn your history. 
Oh, of course. And I 100% agree with that. Like, in my opinion, history is one of the most important things to study. Um, it may not be my favorite thing to study um, in a whole regards, and I, but I, I love it, but it's not my favorite. Um, but it's certainly so important. Um, and that's why stories like the The Core Story and like having graphic novels and books like this that's why it's so important because not everything can be taught in a history class. No. And these days, especially when one looks at what our world has gone through in the last year and a half, Mm -hmm. um, you know, which has forced teachers to keep coming up with new ideas about how are you going to reach students who may or may not be in the same room with you, Mm -hmm. who, um, so it's are this very changing view of how we we see things and how we teach things, and so it's um you know when you say not your favorite, I always like to think you know it was maybe history and literature and were my favorites because you know I didn't become a circus clown because I was good at math. <laughs> and, and so it was, a, you know, one of my earlier careers. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, but it's it. I, I as a as a kid, I um, I don't know if you know the classics illustrated comic books. Oh, uh, I don't. I I feel like I have heard of those. Yeah, they, it was um, somebody had this idea of translating classic literature into comic books. So there was, um, you could read Jane Austen Mm -hmm. as a comic book. You could read Frankenstein. You could read all kinds of different things that way. And it was a great way for kids to engage with literature that what 10 year old is going to sit down and, and read Victor Hugo. Oh Uh, yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's anybody who has attempted that, they, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be a lot. Um, it's not easy stuff, and um, in fact, Victor Hugo was. A, there was a comic I saw when I was a kid, and I bought it called "The Man Who Laughs," and by Victor Hugo, not one of his best known novels. Um, it's there aren't many translations in English, but it's um, a story about. Well, I won't. <laughs> going, people can look for it. There's actually a silent movie that was made oh. of it, but it's about a a boy who has been his face has been cut into a smile, and for entertainment purposes. And this is in 18th century England, and it so disturbed me that mm-hmm. it is the only comic book in my life that I have willingly put in a trash can. Wow. And, but years later, I came across the actual novel and read it. Mm. And um, then, you know, searched (laughs) for another copy of the the comic Mm -hmm. book. But but I think that's the, that's one of the things that graphic novels and and graphic work can do too. It's it isn't just the end point. You can go on from there and certainly hopefully discover more um, more graphic novels that may deal with that. Just to open up your eyes to to a whole world of you know creators putting words and pictures or just words. Mm-hmm out there into the world. And it's so important, um, like kind of what you were saying too, it's so important for literacy. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's something that my family has always said um, because we've done like tutoring and tutoring reading in schools and stuff like that. And we've always said that graphic novels are some of the most important ones to get kids into reading. Yeah. Um, And I remember when I was, I was pretty young. Um, but at the time I had already read a wrinkle in time, but I got a, um, I had a graphic novel copy as well. 
And I still have it. I, it's one of my favorite graphic novels. Um, I believe Hope Larson did the translation. Um, and I remember reading it thinking, this is something so important. And so many people should be reading these kinds of things. Because a lot of the times looking at parts of history or um, parts of long form literature can be so daunting. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a way to really go in depth into that. And it kind of takes away a lot of those barriers too. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, well, and I really think it, it's an act of engagement that one has with literature mm -hmm. and for many people, and especially people who, um, you know, with ADHD or all kinds of different just attitudes toward literature. It's one that they can approach. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean it's exclusively for one group or another. If, if it's done well, I, it can reach a huge audience um, and instruct. I remember um, years ago that the South Africa did not have a comic book Per company, any any comic books that the country of South Africa got mm -hmm. were from outside, usually from Great Britain or the United States. And so a group of artists and writers got together and they decided we are going to do a comic book company. And what they did, their very first comic book was one that dealt with HIV AIDS and was able to to look at domestic violence as well. And so and it was done for primarily for the population that had been kept out of education or their education. You know, the, the um, black people had, you know, the schools were closed. They you know, all of the, the terrible suffering that they went through during the apartheid. And, and here was this growing issue with HIV, AIDS, domestic violence, all of that. And it was a great way to do it. And yeah. in the center, the centerfold of the comic book, it graphically depicted exactly how one uses a condom. And one, you know, you could explain that, but drawing it in pictures, people immediately know this is how a condom is used. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I mean, it's why if you get on an airplane, that in a sense is kind of a graphic work of nonfiction when yeah. <laughs> you get that card that says, oh, this is how you look at this. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. This is what you do. Um, and, and sometimes the things that I, I found in graphic novels that like what you were saying about um, the Victor Hugo story, they can be um, some things can be disturbing upon first viewing. And then later you come back to it. That actually just happened with me. Um, there was this one graphic novel and it's not that it's not disturbing. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I was I was freaked out by it when I was younger. It's called Beautiful Darkness. Um, it's really a stunning book. And when I first read it, I remember being so freaked out by it and not getting it. Um, but it and that this was years and years ago, like I was probably like eight. Um, and this year, like a, a few days ago, I found it again at the library. I just stumbled upon it and I was like, I am going to read this again. And I did, and I loved it, and I took so much more out of it than I did on that first reading. Yeah, I, I and it used to be, even though nobody ever called them graphic novels or anything, illustrated novels, illustrated mm -hmm. all kinds of literature. Um, that when I was a little kid, that we had a copy of, you know, Dante, Divine Comedy on the mm -hmm. Shelf with the Gustave Doré illustrations. And it was on the shelf, but wow, it was about 
hell and heaven. And and so it was nobody could say, what are you doing? Looking at all those pictures of naked people, which, of course, was part of the draw. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also made me it made me wonder, what is this book really about? Mm -hmm. And um, so I think I was 12 years old when I first read that translation. And I've read several translations since. And actually, um, I think I may be the only person in the world who has done both a comic book called the Dante Primer or Mm -hmm. Primer um, that talks about Dante and an illustrated book, uh, Dante for Beginners. Um, That is so interesting. I Yeah, I I had never heard of someone else who had done two different translations like that. Yeah, and and so it's um, you know, it it's a great way to of entry, and it can be, um, you know, contained within one book, which is what I try to do with Eva. But of course, there is so much more that one can learn mm-hmm. about Eva Core and and the experience of the twins and the Holocaust and World War II. So, you know, it isn't. It's one story and it's one translation of that story. Yes, for sure. Uh And like your book is so important too, because while reading it and afterwards as well, it made me want to do more research into the Holocaust and learn more about what happened and uh, learn more about Eva Kaur. Um, Because reading this, it was like, a taste of it. So I was like, oh, I can see what happened from this one person's perspective, but I want to, I want to know what the other perspectives were, were there other people? And I think that's something that can be so important, kind of like getting that taste for more knowledge. Yeah. And there are, of this, the survivors, there are, everyone has a very specific experience within this time period and within what happened. I think, um, and I mentioned my father in the opening, who was, uh, he was uh, part of the Third Armored Division, uh, the First Army. He did, of course, they, the, um, the death camps in Poland were liberated by the Soviet Red Army. Um, but American soldiers, uh, British soldiers, that so many of the Allied troops liberated other camps. And he was involved with the liberation of a concentration work camp. And the horrors he saw, uh, and this is one of those things that there are films of the American troops entering Nordhausen, which was the the camp. And this was was not a major camp, but for these soldiers experiencing, and and of course they've come through war, but to see what had been done to people in these camps um, was, it was so horribly shocking to the American troops, to the British troops, to the Soviet troops. to see that this kind of mechanized uh, way of of killing and all of that was just, it was left people, um, all of these people, all the soldiers, it's a traumatic experience. So actually having been a survivor of that, you can only, I mean, can't even imagine what that, the trauma that that, would have imparted it's it's so horrifying yeah um well you know actually this has been such a great conversation but we are running out of time um to talk but thank you so so much for coming on i had an incredible time chatting with you well thank you it's uh I thank you molly this has been great being here with you and and thank you for for you know looking at the book and 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 your comments about it because it's 
it's important to me and it's important to a, you know, a much wider group of people than just me. So thank you for telling such a powerful story um, and putting like Eva Kors words and her life out there. Um, and at any time, if you ever want to come back on the <laughs> It's always open. You're welcome anytime on the show. Um, I just have one last question, and that is, what do you have coming up? Well, um, I just illustrated, um, and this isn't something I wrote, and it's a little different than a, a graphic novel, but for the For Beginners Company that I publish and I've done a lot of work with, um, I just did a book on C.S. Lewis. Oh, and So that'll be out sometime in the near future. And I certainly hope to work with um, my friends at Red Lightning Books. Mm -hmm. um, I've got, as I said to Eva, I've got ideas. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I was, this is, hey, I can sit here, whether there's a pandemic or not, at my drawing table just over to the side here and write and draw. And so it's, it's good. That is awesome. Well, thank you once again for coming on. For Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. And I'm Joe Lee. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after, the end. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at Read Between the Lines podcast and on Twitter at RBTL podcast. Make sure to follow the authors who I've been talking to to hear all about their upcoming projects and also because they're cool people. This show is hosted by me, Molly Southgate, and produced and edited by my dad, Rob Southgate. Read Between the Lines is a Southgate Media Group production, and you can find all the great content put on by the network at southgatemediagroup.com. You can read the story of how I and many other podcasters started in the anthology book Pod Life, which you'll find at the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes are links to buy the books featured on this episode. Using those links supports this show and the incredible authors being interviewed. Have a great week and keep reading.